Thank you. Yeah, I'm a little, uh, wow, there's a lot of people here. Um, I am, wow, I'm a little nostalgic today. I remember October 7th, uh, 2012, when Mission Church, uh, just down the street at Stratford Middle School, went from one service to two services to make room for more. And we've been living in this world of two services. Did you guys hear yet today that we're going to three services next week? Did you catch that? Okay. Um, no, but this is really cool. I'm trying to take this all in. Last Sunday of two services, making room for more. We've been asking the question for the last few weeks, what is the more on the mind of God? Man, I just can't get over it. There's still people coming in. This is so cool. Man, God is good. What is the more on the mind of God? Uh, John has been taking us uh, on a journey through the story of Jonah to ask this question. What's the more on the mind of God? As a review, week one, the more was surrender. Jonah ran from God instead of running with God. Week two, the more on the mind of God, salvation. You may be helpless, but you are not hopeless. There is a God who saves. This is the God we just worship. And then last week, week three, the, the more on the mind of God is sending. God not only saves, but then he sends. There is a more on the mind of God that I really hoped we'd be talking about today. It also starts with an S. It's Super Bowl. But... <laughs> Sorry to bring it up. Unfortunately, uh, Thursday night, I see a couple of my Packer fan enemies out there. Um, but um, I know it didn't go as well as we had hoped, uh, so that's clearly not the more on the mind of God. But the more on the mind of God that I do want to talk about is mission. Now, I realize that we are called Mission Church. That's not exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about mission, its essence, like the idea of being sent, living a sent life. Um, who God is, therefore this is who you are. What you have been set apart to do because what God has done, mission. Mission comes from the Latin word missio, okay? Just remove the N, missio, you get the Latin word. That word was used to translate Hebrew and Aramaic words used in the New Testament for send or sent, right? For instance, Jesus said in John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you mission. This has always been the more on the mind of God, right? This is not a shock because this is who God is. is. This is part of his identity. This has always been the more on the mind of our church. Like it's pretty obvious. It's in our name, Mission Church. We kind of care about the idea of mission and being sent. If you haven't noticed in our lobby, we have a picture of an aircraft carrier. That is not because we were trying to attempt to have a nautical theme in our lobby. That's not why we did that. Nor are we really into ships. The reason there's a picture of an aircraft carrier in our lobby is because we want to make sure that you know that this church intends to equip you and then send you, to train you up and then to launch you. This might be news to you. I don't know your church background. I don't know if you've ever been in a church before. I don't know if you've ever heard much about the person of Jesus, but let me just clarify something. Jesus did not commission a building for people to gather in. He didn't do that. Jesus did not commission even a gathering of people. Jesus did not commission the organization of people by any means. What Jesus did is he commissioned a movement of people. To help you understand the urgency, the importance, the severity of this conversation, why I want to talk about this, why every chance I get the mic I want to talk about this, why even though John talked about sending last week, I'm talking about it again, here's why. And I'm going to need the help of some of you in this room. I'm going to call on a small group of you, and all I'm going to ask you to do is just stand up for a couple minutes, or seconds, a couple seconds. All you got to do is just stand up. I'm not going to ask you to do anything else. If you have a September birthday to help me out and help us out. Just please stand up. September birthday. I'm not gonna ask you to do anything weird. September birthday, yep. Yeah, it's okay, safe, yep. Awesome, thank you. You wanted to see if other people were gonna stand. You waited, I like that, very strategic. Okay, stay standing. These are September birthdays. Now, uh, this is your birthday month. Kelsey, birthday yesterday, happy birthday. Um, we're not gonna sing to them. Just quickly on the count of three, say happy birthday. One, two, three. Happy birthday. Okay, you guys here in the center, Stay standing. You guys out here, sit down. I know you were just up for a second. And you guys out here, just sit down. You guys stay standing. Okay. This is why living a missional life and understanding the urgency of living a missional life is important, okay? We in this room, okay, there's probably 575 of us, I would guess. I'm the guy that counts every Sunday. That's why I know that. There's about 575 people of us, I would guess. 
If you took the totality of our reach, all right, so like wherever you live, wherever you learn, wherever you work, wherever you play, whatever the totality of your reach is, it probably equals hundreds of thousands of people, the 10, the 10 towns God has called us to, that's 262,000. Then add on the places that you live, learn, work, play outside of the 10. That is the makeup of the whole room. Are you tracking? If that were so, then amongst that group of hundreds of thousands of people, relatively speaking, people amongst that group who would identify as Christians who follow Jesus and are committed to their faith would be less than the people standing. My question for you, Mission Church, stay standing one more second. Are we okay with this? And if so, why are we okay with this? You guys can sit down. Give them a hand. Thank you. And happy birthday. Now, if we were to talk in the hall or go out for coffee or whatever, and I was like, are you okay with this? You'd be like, no, I'm not okay with this. And I'd be like, me neither. And we would believe each other. And I wonder if when it comes to living a missional life and really living sent, okay, I wonder if we like the idea of it more than we want to live the identity of it. And this is the question I want us to wrestle with with this morning over and over again. When it comes to living a missional life, do you just like the idea of it? Do you like associating yourselves with it? Or do you truly desire to live the identity of it? Like truly be a part of it? Is there a difference? Yeah, let me help you out. Okay, I, Tommy, would say, I'm a Cubs fan. However, in reality, just to be clear, the regular season is almost over. I have not watched a single inning of Cubs baseball all year. I haven't. But I would say, I am a Cubs fan. I like the idea of being a Cubs fan, really just because I don't like the idea of being a Sox fan, sorry to say, <laughs> Sox fans in the room. I'll watch the Cubs if they make it to the playoffs into the World Series, but I'm a Cubs fan. You tracking? Some of you, you might say, um, I work out. <laughs> yeah. But in reality, you just have a gym membership that you pay for every month. And you own gym shoes, right? Can I get a witness? Yeah. Maybe, maybe you would say, and, and this one maybe hits closer to home. Maybe you'd say, yeah, yeah, I'm missional. Yeah, I'm missional. But maybe in reality, you just go to mission church. Maybe you just attend a church that has missional things on the wall, that has missional dreams, that equips you in missional ways. When it comes to living a missional, sent life, is it more an idea you like or an identity you really desire to live. I want to talk about this today, but before I do, I want to commend a growing number of us within Mission Church who are living out the value of going missionally. They're taking their life seriously with urgency, and they're planting themselves in a family of missionary servants, missional community, amidst people unlike them. We're going to find out in the word they're called outsiders, and they're bringing the good news of Jesus Christ, and this number is growing faster than it ever has in the history of our church. In the spring and summer, we have baptized people more regularly, people that we have met and engaged with out there, not just in here, because we've brought the good news of Jesus to them. This is a good thing, and it's going to continue, and it must continue. But when it comes to living a missional life, you like the idea of it or live the identity of it. There's actually two ways that you can tell, two ways you can do kind of a litmus test on your life. I'm gonna help us do that today if you're curious, okay? To do so, we're gonna look in the book of Colossians. If you have your Bible or the Bible app, go ahead and get to Colossians chapter four. It's towards the end of your Bible. Uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and then Colossians. If you're following along in the Mission Church app, click the gather button. You can follow along, take notes. The verses are in there. This is excuse me, a letter to the church in Colossae, hence their name is the Colossians. And in this book, Paul, a missionary, is writing to them. And some of the topics he talks about with this church is, is how to live um, fully alive in Christ, how to have the fullness of Christ. He even talks to Christian households, how to do that. And in this section, chapter four, what he's doing is he's giving further instructions to them. It's sort of a like, hey, and by the way, don't forget this next piece. It's really important. I'm leaving you with this. Here's what he says to them. This is Paul, verse two, Colossians four. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I, Paul, am in chains. 
Pray that I, Paul, may proclaim it clearly as I should. And he gives further instructions. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. The first way that you can tell, if living the missional life is an idea you like or an identity you live, pretty simple. Number one, are people asking? Pretty simple. Verse six, it says, so that you may know how to answer everyone. This implies that people are asking. Do you live your life in such a way that demands a gospel explanation? And do you live your life proximate to people who would demand a gospel explanation? Here's why this is important. Paul, in writing to the church in these few verses, he does a couple things. First thing he does in the first few verses I read, he acknowledges that within the church, capital C Church, there is a very small select few people who have this strong gift of evangel- evangelism, this idea of like getting in front of a small group or a large group of people and saying, this is who Jesus is to me, and then telling that to other people. Paul had this gift. And he said, because I have this gift, pray for me. He says it in these verses, pray for me that I would share it clearly and boldly that the message would be heard, right? And Paul also knew that for a vast majority of us, like me, like probably almost all of us in this room, that our primary evangelistic mission would be in response to people's questions, thus implying we must be living questionable lives. Two guys who study this stuff, Alan Hirsch and Michael Frost, they wrote a book together called The Shaping of Things To come in this book, they tell the story of a young man who was a Baptist pastor who set out to plant a church in San Francisco, and he did so. And unfortunately, like half the churches that try to start in America, it did not work. It did not make it the first year. And so he thought and asked himself a really critical question. He said, what do I love? What am I really passionate about? And in this guy's case, oddly enough, it was shoes, like footwear. That's just what he loved to do. He knew all kinds. He owned a bunch of shoes. He knew all about shoes. He had connections in the shoe industry. So he was like, I'm going to open a shoe store in San Francisco. And here's how he did business. Uh, It was a small shop. He was the owner and the one employee. People would come in. Now we buy shoes at like Zappos and Amazon, right? But people used to go in stores to buy shoes. I don't know if you remember this. But people would walk in uh, to, to the store and he'd say, thanks for coming in. Can I help you find something? And they would reply back to them, most often than not, no, no thanks, I'm just going to look around for a while. He'd wait a couple seconds, then he would take a really critical step closer in their direction. And he'd say, well, then if you don't mind while you're looking, could you tell me a little bit about yourself? Even if you want, like, go ahead and you can tell me your whole life story. The more I know, the better that I can fit you with the perfect pair of shoes. You just got to know something. I know shoes. The more you tell me, the better chance of you getting the perfect Shoes, And after kind of like the shock and like this, this weird kind of wore off the customer, they would oblige and he would find that they would tell him. Sometimes the stories would be five minutes, sometimes 25 minutes, sometimes two hours, usually ending in tears and hugging and best friends have just been formed. And the owner says, okay, just hold on a second, okay? Gives him some Kleenex and like scurries off to the inventory room and brings back a box and says, how about these? And more often than not, keep in mind, the customer just shared their story. They're weeping. They're like ugly crying. They look at the shoes and they're like, those are perfect. And he goes, all right, let's, let's try these on. And they fit, of course. And then he walks into the counter and they begin the transactions. The people, the customer pays for the shoes and customers, of course, are like, who are you? He's like, oh, I'm just a shoe store owner. They're like, no, no, come on. They're like, who are you and where did you come from? And this was his moment that he chose to seize. And in these moments when they would ask about his questionable, peculiar life, he'd say, I'm just a regular guy who owns a shoe store that knows that he is deeply loved by God. And so I want to share that love with as many people as I can so that I can introduce them to the person of Jesus. 
What this guy came to find out, sadly, he never would have thought this would have happened, that owning a shoe store after one year would convert and help more people find and follow Christ than his conventional church. Who ever knew? Just by simply living a questionable life. Mission Church, receive this with grace because I've been challenged by it this week. So you're just joining me in this. But you need to hear it. We need to hear this. Nobody is going to ask you about the hope that you have if you live the same middle-class suburban life as everybody else. There's just not. If your marriage looks like everybody else's in this world, if the way you parent looks like everyone else's in your kid's school, if the career track that you're on looks like everybody else's, if the way that you spend your money, if the way that you vacation, if the house that you live in, if the, if the remodel you're doing, if the cars you drive, if the social media you post, if everything that you do looks exactly like the people you are in the midst of, why on earth would they ever ask you anything about the hope that you have? Similarly, for those of you who might live a questionable life, who might live a countercultural life, and still no one's asking... It might be because you only live amongst and you are only proximate and you only give access to people who are exactly like you. This is called a Christian bubble. I got one. I got one. All right. Golf club. Thank you. Whoever you are, can I give you a hug after service? Because my mom. No, just kidding. The missional life requires you to be proximate and peculiar to outsiders, okay? Read this again. The missional life, not recommends, requires you to be proximate and peculiar to outsiders. I can't believe I'm about to say this, but I'm going to ask you guys a question. Mission Church, can we just be a little weird for the sake of Jesus? Can we? Before you... Take, <laughs> you're weird, no. Before you take and run with this, though, can I just be really clear what I didn't say, okay? I did not say, can we weird people out? I did not say that. We as Christians have been doing just fine in that department for years. Don't weird people out. But can we just be a little weird? Can we just be a little peculiar with our lives? Can we make decisions in how we love and how we serve people that arouses their questions and evokes their curiosity? Why? Not for our glory, but so that we can introduce them to the person of Jesus Christ. Only for that reason. Can we just be a little weird? Don't go nuts, please. But just a little bit weird. Do you like the idea of missionary more than you live the identity. Verse five, just to go back, it says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, right? People who don't believe what we believe. Make the most of every opportunity. Number one, are people asking? Number two, are you telling? Okay, are people asking, are you telling? Pretty simple. How many of you, when it comes to making the most of an opportunity, especially a relational opportunity, how many of you make the most of that opportunity without even saying a word? It's like nearly impossible. How many of you in the moment of seizing a critical, critical, when it comes to seizing a moment with someone, decides to bring along one of these to display what you're trying to communicate rather than opening up your mouth? Has anybody ever done that? Talk about weirding people out. No, this is Pierre the Mime, by the way. He costs a lot of money. I did some research on him. But when it comes to seizing a moment, making the most of every opportunity, behavioral modification is not enough. You've got to proclaim something. You can definitely take that scary guy down. Um, little story. When I met my wife, um, keep in mind this was a different time. I was a different person. But when I met my wife... I didn't know her. She, she walked by. Here, here were my three goals, pretty simple. Uh, see girl, meet girl, get girl's number. That was pretty much my plan. And so she walked by. Now, to do this, to reach this goal, I didn't wave from across the room like a creep my Motorola StarTac flip phone at her, which is what I owned at the time. Do you guys remember those? I didn't wave this at her, hoping she'd understand, oh, that weird guy wants my number. I'm going to run over there and give it to him. That didn't go down like that. No. I actually put my phone away. I walked over there, I approached her, I opened my mouth, I showed some personality, I was relationally intelligent, I listened to a little bit about her, and the rest, of course, is history. Yeah, I got her number. I can't believe she gave it to me, but I got her number. 
to seize a moment, you have to open your mouth. In your life, in making the most of opportunities, are you speaking up or are you staying silent? Donald Whitney, he wrote a book called Spiritual Practices for the Christian Life, older book. In that book, he tells a story of a boss and an employee. And the employee went to a crusade uh, one weekend. A crusade would be a gathering like this where there's an evangelist up preaching, teaching about Jesus. So the employee finds himself at a crusade. And at this crusade, he accepts the good news of Jesus Christ. And he makes Jesus Christ his Lord and Savior. He becomes a Christian. He's immediately on fire. He wants to tell everybody this good news. He cannot wait to tell his boss on Monday morning. He gets into work. He goes into his boss's office. And he's like, you're not going to believe it. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And the boss looked back at him and said, that's great. I've been praying for you for years. And the employee's like, you're a Christian? Yeah, awkward. He goes, you're the reason I hadn't become a Christian. And by the way, it's not because you're a bad person. It's actually because I think you are amazing. He said, I thought the hope and the joy that you lived with, you had generated on your own. Therefore, I thought I would try to generate it on my own. And I have found time and time again, it doesn't work. And you're telling me all along, it's been Jesus Here's my point in telling you this story. If you have decided to follow Jesus and you have the hope of Jesus and people see this hope of Jesus and you never proclaim the hope of Jesus, how confusing is that for people looking on, wondering what is this hope that they have? Keep in mind this. I talked about living a questionable life. You cannot control if people will actually step forward and ask you these questions about your life. You can't control that. You can do the best you can to live a questionable life, but you can't control if people are going to ask you. And so when they don't, will you speak up? Will you proclaim the name of Jesus? We can just as easily deter people from Jesus by not saying him as our hope. Penn Gillette of the comedic duo Penn and Teller, have you guys heard of Penn and Teller? Um, yeah, Penn. He is a very outspoken and well-known atheist. He actually is so good at being an atheist, he won an award for it. I didn't know there was such a thing, but he did. He said this when it comes to not speaking up. He said, I've always said that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. That word means try to convert people, okay? So I'll say it like that. I've always said that I don't respect people who don't try to convert people. If you believe that there's a heaven and a hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life, and you think that it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward, how much do you have to hate somebody to not try to convert them? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? He goes on to say, I mean, if I believed beyond the shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe a truck was coming at you, there's a certain point where I would tackle you. Verse 5 in Colossians 4, it says, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity in how you behave and what you say. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Are people asking? Are you telling? It's really that simple for you to know when it comes to living a missional life. Do you like the idea of it or do you live the identity of it. In the summer of 2012, as we were getting prepared to launch Mission Church, we were a uh, group of 50 people. We called ourselves a launch team because we're super clever. So we called ourselves a launch team and we would gather on Sunday nights in the cafeteria of Stratford Middle School. Some of you, I see your faces, you were, you were here back then. And uh, we had a friend of ours, Dave Ferguson. He came and he visited us. Uh, Dave has led a, m a number of church plants across the country. And so we came, we had him coach us, encourage us. And one night, I remember, he gave us all napkins and a pen. And he asked us, he said, what is a dream that you are dreaming of because Mission Church is starting in just a few months? What are you dreaming about that start? And then he asked, what might the more on the mind of God be because Mission Church is starting? And he gave us a few moments to pray and to listen and to craft what our dream would be. And when we were moving from our office in Glendale Heights to this building, our office right over there, I found in the bottom of my drawer my napkin. 
it was not in this. It was like almost disheveled in the bottom of my drawer. And I wrote, <laughs> I wrote this uh, eight, yeah, eight years ago. <sighs> and um, it's, yeah. So it says dream, because it was my dream. It says dream. It says 40,000 people finding and following Christ in the 10, any way, anyhow. This is what I dreamt about in the summer of 2011. And you might be like, 40,000 people, that's a bit audacious. Like, what were you thinking? Well, here's my dream with 40,000 people. When it comes to Christian movements throughout history that have happened, and when it comes to what sociologists say needs to happen for movements to happen, 40,000 people would be what is needed in the 262,000 people of the 10 for movement to be ignited, for things to infect and affect culture in the name of Jesus. It's also known as a tipping point. And the reason that I haven't shared a lot about this, the reason it doesn't even hang on my wall, it just sits on the floor in my office, is because two reasons. It's not about my dream. Okay, I want to be really clear. This is not about my dream. And two, I don't want it to be about the numbers either. And at the same time, I'm convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that when it comes to the people who were gathered in this room an hour ago and the people that are gathered in here now, God could give us collectively 42,000 names like that. I know he could. People that are in our midst that need to find and accept Jesus Christ as their savior. That's easy for him. That's what a movement of Jesus in the ten looks like. Now, we serve a God who is capable of anything. Nothing is too big for our God. But just on a human level, let me help you understand how not crazy 40,000 people finding and following Christ in the 10 is. Can I show you how easy it is? How not crazy it is? Okay. September birthdays who are standing in the center, you are invited to stand one more time. September birthdays who are standing in the center. Yeah, you're getting a good leg workout. Yeah, way to go. Good job standing. All right. So, Here's what it would look like to go from where we're at to where we need to be, to see a movement of Jesus in the 10. Don't stand yet, but two groups of people I'm going to ask to stand. The remaining September birthdays and then the October birthdays on the count of three. And watch. One, two, three. This is it. Okay. Stay standing. Not crazy, guys. Not that far out of reach. Of course, through the eyes and in the power of God, like easy, game over, done. This is nothing for him. But when it comes to what our human mind can understand and what motivates us, this is not that far off. We're not that far away. What we need to decide, if you guys could stay standing for just another moment so we can take the sin. If you guys can join me in deciding, do we believe an all-powerful God can do this? We have to decide that. Believe an all loving God wants to do this? Do we believe that the person of Jesus changes our lives and not theirs? Most importantly, do you believe that the Spirit of God alive in you intends to reach this group of people, the remaining of us? Do you believe the Spirit of God intends to use us by staying silent or by speaking up, by being stationary or by being? guys can take a seat. The more on the mind of God is mission, being sent. It's what he's always been about. It's what he charged his people with, with the word go for 2,000 years ago. What you need to decide is when it comes to living a missional life, do you, person in your chair, do you like the idea of it? close, I want to just celebrate and give honor and commend those of you, over a hundred of you that are, like I said earlier, living out the value of planting yourself where God has you. Most of you in the context of a missional community, my charge to you is stay encouraged. Do not pull back. Stay on the front lines. I promise you, because we're talking about it, we're strategizing about it, more help, more support, more simplicity, more clarity is coming your way. Would you please just stay on the front lines? We have just started and we need you. For those of you who <laughs> for those of you who are growing intentionally on our growth track, hundreds of you, would you stay at it? The growth track exists to prepare you to go and help people find and follow Christ. Would you stay at it? 
Some of you I know, you signed up last term and you didn't show up, and that's okay. We're going to keep doing it. The good news for you is that October 15th, the growth track starts again. Would you please take your first step or your next step to be prepared to launch? We want to equip you to do this. And for those of you, maybe you're totally new here, like I've never even been in church before, just begin to gather differently. The best way you can do that is what Dan said. Grab that card and just start volunteering your time. Just start to give a little bit more back to God. And lastly, I gotta just invite you, if you're not ready for a missional step out there, maybe a missional step that you're really comfortable with and just need to take now is in here. Be sent to the 12. The 12 needs your presence. The 12 needs your energy. The 12 needs the spirit of God alive in you to be present when our guests show up. Maybe just take that step to be sent if you haven't committed already. You gotta make room for more surrender finish our last Sunday at two services. Some of you, you might not be sent because you're not saved, and that makes perfect sense. Why would you be sent if you have not yet been saved? I'm telling you that there is a God who sent a son to die for you. He wants to claim you as son of God. He wants to claim you as son or daughter today. If you have not prayed the prayer of salvation, I'm not talking about have you been baptized. I'm saying have you called upon the name of the Lord? Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I want to give you an opportunity to make that decision, to pray that prayer today. You can repeat this after me in your heart. Sorry, Heavenly Father, I am sorry that my life has caused a separation between me and you. Thank you for sending the gift of your son, Jesus, who lived the perfect life, who died in my place so that I can have eternal life with you. And lastly, those of you who have this desire to be sent by God. Why? Because you've been saved and therefore you need to be sent. Not out of an obligation because it's who you are. It's part of your identity because it's who God is. We pray a prayer of sending for you if you want to open your palms up to receive this prayer. Holy Spirit, we invite you to invade and disturb, disturb and disrupt our lives. We ask that you would give us the people and the places to go to. We pray for Help us and show us how to live lives worth questioning. We ask that when people would show up with our questions, that in love and with so much grace, we would boldly speak the name of Jesus, the only one who saves. We ask that so many people, hundreds and thousands, because of where we are planted, will find and follow Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. If we would all stand up. I want to just read a quick verse, a benediction of sorts to send you guys out of here. Thank you for being an amazing church to lead. The best is yet to come in the days to come. There's so much room for more. This is from Romans 10, verse 14. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written. Nine, ten, thirty, and twelve next week. We'll see you next week. We are mission. See you guys.